All right, so welcome everyone to the fourth science seminar talk of the semester. Uh, these seminars will be happening every Friday, except on uh, Reading Week, which is November 15th at 2.30 in Brody 447, right where we are right here, and on Zoom. So on this note, uh, next week's talk on the 25th will be given by Dr. Colin McCarter, an assistant professor at Nipissing University in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Dr. McCarter's talk will be focused on how wetland fires are releasing our toxic industrial legacy. And this talk will be given via Zoom, so we hope you will join us there. Uh, most importantly for today's talk, we are pleased to be joined by Brown University's Dr. Terrence McGonigal, a professor in the Department of Biology. Dr. McGonigal has been teaching courses on plants in the Department of Biology for almost 20 years. His PhD was on our vascular mycorrhizae in, at the University of York in the United Kingdom, where his advisor was Dr. Alastair Fitter, a fellow of the Royal Society. Terence has published widely on soil plant relationship in agriculture, as well as on topics more generally from within the field of ecology. In addition to guiding many undergraduate research projects over the years, Terence has an ongoing commitment uh, to advise students within the uh, Master of Science program in Life and Environmental Sciences at Brandon University. Dr. McGonagall's talk today is titled Exploring Plant Diversity by Eucalyptus in Australia and Bryophytes in Canada. Following Dr. McGonagall's presentation, there will be time for questions and discussion. So help yourself to snacks and coffee at the back of the room, and please help me in joining Dr. McGonagall. So I was um, able to go on uh, some sabbatical travel to uh, explore uh, eucalyptus in Australia, and also back home in Canada, I was able to explore some bryophytes, mosses and liverworts, uh, in, uh, in in British Columbia. So that'll be my focus uh, today. So eucalyptus then, uh, we have um, trees in the family Myrtaceae. So very briefly, for eucalyptus, we have um, uh, trees that are broad-leaved but uh, evergreen. That's a little bit unusual. We're used to seeing trees in North America that are broad-leaved and deciduous, winter deciduous, but not having that severe winter like we have in North America. And the leaves are uh, rather lance-shaped, lanceolate, but also sort of egg-shaped at the bottom, widest, widest near the bottom. So combining that ovate lanceolate. The female is uh, inferior, that is, the, the, the seeds are produced below where the flower is put together. Uh, in a single structure, the female parts are in a single structure, so a single pistil. And the perianth, that's just the combination of the petals and sepals is then gathered together into a new structure in eucalyptus called the operculum or lid, whereby this is the structure here, that we have um, a sort of cap that comes off when the uh, bud is mature to reveal the flower below. And there's no, there's no petals then because they were part of the lid. And then the flower itself is presented as these, these uh, stamens, the male parts, which will do the business of attracting the pollinator. So the whole showy part of the flower is the male here. And then at, at maturity, the, um, the seeds will be produced uh, below uh, where those uh, stamens were inserted uh, in, in, in the structure that will be dry and then open up, that's a capsule. And here are the capsules uh, for uh, the eucalyptus at the maturity. So anyway, that's our basic uh, design of, of the eucalyptus plant. And, there's a number of interesting distinct features that go along with being a eucalyptus. The leaves in the juvenile condition are different. They're, they're, they're often wider. They are arranged uh, in an opposite pattern instead of being alternate up to stem. Uh, and then uh, some trees, uh, not many within the genus, but some stay with the juvenile form throughout the entire lifespan. So for example, eucalyptus cinerea, so-called argyle apple, which is argyle as a county. Uh, uh, it retains the juvenile form throughout life, but even to flowering. But but most of them switch over from the juvenile form to the to the um, to the mature leaves. Then uh, for fire adaptation, there's the uh, lignotuber. So it's a it's a, a bulge at the base of the trunk that will regrow following fire. There's also the epicormic growth, so they can grow right out of the trunk. New leaves coming straight, little branches coming straight out of the trunk following fire to recover. And they, they, in a way, encourage their own fire. The leaves are highly flammable from eucalyptus, eucalyptus oil, which will uh, sort of clean out the neighbors, as it were, by having a catastrophic fire. But of course, they can recover because they've got this lignotuber and, and epicormic growth. So they can, 
they can they can get get rid of the competition and then monopolize after the fire passes through. And then some of the species adopt what they call the Mali form, which is more like a shrub kind of form. And here I am on uh, Mount Wellington in Tasmania, and these are Mali forms here, where you have uh, the, the, the trees are rather short, um, and they have multiple stems coming from uh, the base. This can either be at an elevation like this, or it can be in rather dry conditions. Uh, but there we are on the mountains often. So here's eucalyptus, uh, cruciferum, Tasmanian snow gum. So different features of eucalyptus. Let's have a look at the whole country. And uh, so our typical understanding of what Australia looks like would be this uh, arid area here with um, our that's highly weathered tropical soil that's rather orange and red in color. We've got uh, a few sparse trees, a few shrubs. And this is our uh, arid shrubland, low woodland and grassland that's occupying much of the central part of Australia. And this, this biome summary is from uh, Chris uh, 2004. So then we have uh, where all the people live. Of course, down here, this is Victoria, Melbourne, and then up here, New South Wales, Sydney, Canberra's in there too. This is our southeastern temperate zone. There's the western temp uh, southwestern temperate zone. That's where Perth and Western Australia is. And then we have up north from Brisbane on into Queensland, we have, of course, the, the uh, monsoons so of seasonal rain, highly you know, seasonal rainfall, wet, warm. Seasonal, and then we get this aseasonal uh, 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 biome in a line around here, sort of C shaped lines, chevron there. And note down here for Tasmania that half the western half of Tasmania is this uh, uh, aseasonal wet climate. Well, I was lucky enough to get into Tasmania, and that whole west of the island is completely impenetrable. You cannot get in it, no roads, no trails, nothing. The only way in is a cruise on the Gordon River, very limited access. And when you do get in and have a look at it, it's completely, as I say, impenetrable jungle, very, very moist and wet, as we see here. So what am I going to focus on today for eucalypts? Now, what is the diversity of eucalypts? And how did this diversity arise? And those two questions can be fairly easily addressed. There's literature on this. And then, more practical, what tools do we have to navigate this diversity? How do you, how do you work with that when it's, it's actually going to, you're going to see a lot of diversity? So what tools have we got to try and negotiate that uh, as a student of it? So here's the list of, of, uh, of species for eucalyptus, we, or, or a summary. We have um, 690 species in the genus eucalyptus. There we go. And you can add subspecies as well, bringing that up to 832. And we have two related gen genera. There's Corymbia and Angophora. So Corymbia has the flowers arranged in this, called a corin, but it's a, sort of a flat or roundish topped uh, array of, of flowers. And then Angophora has on the fruits, you can see here, the fruits are ridged in this very prominent ridges, such as the Sydney red gum, Angophora prostata here in the three pictures with this rather red trunk. And uh, many of these Angophora and Corymbia species were formerly described as eucalyptus and then moved over later on. And you can see we've got significant diversity too. There we've got a hundred taxa for Corymbia and another dozen for Angophora. You put it all together, we've got 934 uh, taxa here or 790 species. That's a lot of diversity. In fact, that's, if you compare that to North America, we've got, a thousand trees total for North America. So just for the eucalypts, we've got approaching that in Australia. And there's other tree groups as well there. So we got up over 2,000 for Australia in total. So equivalent to our entire diversity of trees in North America, we've got this one group, eucalyptus, in Australia. How did that come about? And so we look to the paper by Chris, uh, 2004, and uh, radiation is the key word here to emphasize. Uh, so radiation of the Australian flora, what can comparisons of molecular phylogenies across multiple taxa tell us about the evolution of diversity in present day communities? So the Australian fossil record shows that from about 25 million years ago, 
The ice season of wet biome of rainforest and wet peat gave way to the unique Australian sclerophyll biomes dominated by eucalypts. Sclerophyll, that means in an arid or semi-arid environment, the leaves are long-lived to withstand um, the, 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 the harshness of the climate and avoid being eaten. They're rather tough to avoid being eaten. Long-lived uh, herbivore-resistant leaves in sclerophyll biomes. And we have a little bit of that in North America. There's only uh, a, a handful of these uh, broadleaf evergreens in North America. That's the sclerophyll environment that expanded in Australia, dominated by eucalypts, acacias, and casuarinids. I'll move on. Those two other groups I want to talk about. So here's the important bit here about how this occurred. This transition coincided with tectonic isolation of Australia. It, it was attached to Antarctica, and then it separated and moved north. And as it went, leading to cooler, drier, more seasonal climates. And then from three million years ago, Aridification really took hold rapidly, opening up the central uh, zone. So we've got this expansion of uh, aridity. So we can see this radiation in the cladogram from CRISP and co workers. Uh, here we go. This is uh, eucalyptus and the, the subgenera there. Down to the left, you can see Phorindia and uh, Angophora split off quite early here. And you can see here on the right hand side are are markers for time. Australia isolated, um, drier, cooler, more seasonal climate, and then much more recently, severe aridity. So what we've got here is that the ancestral species pool here, then our Myrtaceae, um, isolated in this uh, landmass, separated from the rest of the world, changing climate over these millions, of, over these 25 million years, and this radiation of species out into every Every, every niche, every type of environment within the broadly sclerophyll uh, types of, 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 of sets of environments there. To, and you can see how this, this radiation has occurred with these, these branches across the cladogram there proceeding ever more frequently as we move up to the present day, generating all of this diversity. So that's how we got all these species there. So how do we work with it. How am I going to work with 934 species of trees that look rather similar? How am I going to negotiate that? Well, we use keys, of course, and single access keys are what we're more used to, perhaps, where we have a number of steps that follow a defined sequence without emission. You have to start at step one. You can't miss a step out. And those decisions at each point in the key can be dichotomous, where we have two alternatives, or polytomous, where we have multiple alternatives. So I'll give a couple of examples of those briefly. But more interestingly, multi-access keys uh, using uh, computer-based systems online allow for the user to choose the steps and the order will, will take them to say, well, we'll look at this character and not the others. And we'll look at this one first or before that one. So we have now much more flexibility with there's a, an online multi-access key to work with the eucalypts that I'll illustrate it for you. So it's really not so bad as you might imagine. So Orchids of Manitoba gives a single access key that's dichotomous there. And uh, we can see here at the beginning, step one, there's A and B. Uh, and then we move on. If it's 1A, you go to 2. If it's 1B, you go to 11. So we're following this dichotomous path. And in Orchids here, we've got, you see at the beginning here, it says, is the, it talks about the lip. Okay, well, an orchid flower has three sepals below and three petals above. And one of the petals is called the lip. It's larger. It's where the insect lands for pollination. So our lip is either um, bag like, saccate, like a bowl or slipper, or it's, it's flat like a tiny. So that's straightforward. And on you go through these various steps uh, along the way. A poly. Uh, Thomas example is from Newcomb. This is for uh, wildflowers of uh, eastern Canada and adjacent states where with Newcomb you have to answer three keys, uh, three, three key steps rather, in this order. You must do all three, you must do them in this order. So there's the type of flower. Is it irregular? Well, that, that means uh, is it uh, with only one plane of symmetry, like somebody's head, there's only one plane of symmetry, whereas regular would be like uh, arranged like the spokes of a wheel. 
Then we've got the plant type where we base all leaves only, alternate or uh, opposite, uh, or are we a shrub or a vine? And then the leaf type, uh, uh, do we have a toothed margin or do we have lobes or are we divided into leaflets or are we entire? So we do all those questions. Let's run a quick example. Here is Cyclopedia made poorly, the pink lady slipper. It's irregular flowers, just the one plane of symmetry down here, right down the middle. And we've got uh, basal leaves only, leaves entire, no teeth, just the two basal leaves there, you can see. So if we go to the key, it's straightforward, irregular flowers, basal leaves only, leaves entire, and ask us one more question, leaves two, large and broad, go to page 22, it drops us, parachutes us in right there. And here, and there it is, Cyclopedia may call it a pink lady slipper. So that's, that's a nice way to get in very quickly with these, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, polytomous uh, ways. So let's go online. So Euclid is the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the software online for Eucalypts of Australia. You get to the web page. It's, um, it's been around since the late 90s. Uh, it went national on, the, on CDs, DVDs uh, in 2006, you can see there. And then uh, online, online uh, 2015, there we go. So let's let's have a look at um, a eucalypt. Let's, let's jump right in. Let's have a look at this. A eucalypt. I'm standing in Canberra here. Here's a eucalyptus tree. It's referred to as its name is Mugger. Eucalyptus uh, cyberoxylon. And uh, it has rather eucalyptus like the like looking leaves. And the bark, the bark is uh, deeply furrowed and rigid. This is very tough, you know, rigid and, and deep. But this kind of bark is very common on many North American trees. You look at an elm, it looks like that, but not, not as reddish, but more gray, but, but the, the, the deeply furrowed and, 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 and rigid like that. It's very much like many North American trees, like, like elm. Uh, uh, but in, in Australia, the jargon goes, they call this type of bark, they call it a rough bark rather than smooth. Smooth would be like, like really flat. Uh, they call it rough bark and they call it iron bark. Uh, there's one word, iron bark, is their, their jargon for it. And then if I put on my my camera zoom and I get I can see the flowers in the canopy there, there there's the flowers, those are those are uh, red. And where does this um, species grow? Well it's out here in New South Wales, Canberra. That's the focus there. So let me go to to Euclid. Let's let's just run it. Let's go to Euclid. And uh, we've got this live here. I'm going to get to uh, the checkers at the bottom of the screen. It should pop back, pop back up. There we go. So thank you very much. I'll pull up the. Uh, so I'm now live on Euclid here on the web page. So if I click on uh, start the Euclid key there, should pull it up. There we go. So um, it, it's, um, it gives you these fields here. Uh, you've got uh, entities remaining on the right hand side. They're 934. They're all remaining. So um, I've got uh, quite a few here. I can scroll down on the way there. There's quite a few. And then here's our features. I've 120 features available. I haven't chosen any yet. And uh, uh, entries discarded there. So, so ent entries, uh, 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 entities rather, it says entity, but it's in these packs, it's 934 times. So I can, I can uh, just run it. And let's say, so oh, I was in. So let's say New South, New South Wales. I get the first uh, character here. Let's go to New South Wales. Get New South Wales. And look at that thing. I've dropped out 675 taxa, and I've got 259 left. That's discarded. Right, let's come on down to uh, let's take another character. I, let's find this bark. So rough bark type. I could, I could, I could say uh, bark type. Uh, it could be smooth or it could be rough. Let, let's go with. Um, I'll go with. Um, it's rough bark and. Well, here's our types. So there's types so iron bark or stringy or box or tessellated. So I can choose iron bark. Let's check off iron bark. And it's dropped me down to twenty. So in New South Wales, there's only 20 eucalypts with iron bark. That's that's a bit. So I've got a short list now. Down to a short list. I'm really good. I'm really motoring here. And um, let me go on. Let's let's find flower. I know I'm red flowers. So let's go on. 
flower um, color. There was a flower color, filaments color or stamen color, red. Bang. And then there, it's only one with red. That's a uh, mugger, that's eucalyptus cyanoroxia. Not too bad. It's not too bad. You can you can get down there. Let's let's run another one. But actually, I'll just run it on. I'll I'll, I'll abandon the online. Let's just go back to the talk. If I summarize that then for eucalyptus cyanoroxylon, my taxa remaining drop down with those identifications. Region iron bark red flower. Let's let's have a look at Corymbia physifolia. This red flowered gum is a very common street planting. It's got this beautiful red colour across much of Australia. Here I am in Port Elliot, South Australia. The bark is uh, not iron bark. It's uh, loose and and fibrous. We call it stringy bark. Up there, so we've got stringy bark. Here's another one. This is Hobart. There's the view of Hobart from up on Mount Wellington. You can see in the streets of Hobart. Uh, commonly planted here, the, uh, the, the the tree. And where does it grow naturally? It's actually very limited down here in Western Australia, near Perth, in the south southern part of Western Australia. And then we've got these corymbs of flowers here. The, uh, the flower buds are smooth, and then the fruits, the, the capsules here, are urn shaped. The leaves are well, fig like, hence the name Pisifolia. So, there's, uh, so I, if I run that one on Euclid, uh, Western Australia will drop me down because there's two entries for Western Australia. There's a lot of eucalypts out there. 390 species or tax uh, stringy bark, 100 different, 120 types of stringy bark in south of Western Australia, which is a lot, isn't it? But once again, I've got to get down into the flowers to get out to the you know, which species is it? Go to red flowers, there's four species. Ursulate, that means urn shaped for the fruit shape, gets me down to two, and then flower bud ridges. The flower buds were smooth, and they were uh, smooth only in one of those two options. If I get down to my species, pretty easy. Let me summarize all that then. So your thoughts on Euclid. So um, strong dependence on two features to reduce possibilities to a manageable number. Details of far. State or region that gives me my short list, but there's potential difficulties there. The spectrum is within a managed landscape, you, you know, you don't know exactly is it from this part of the world or is it from somewhere else and introduced here. So, unless you're in the wilds, a little bit of a concern there with emphasis on region. And then, once you get to your, your short list, there a strong reliance on reproductive parts the flower buds, the flowers, the fruits. And of course, these are not always available. You go to a tree, it may not be in flower. Um, you may find yourself uh, looking on the ground for a branch, did it fall off this tree or the next one? Or you may be forced to try and knock some parts off the tree. You might be using a, I, I talked to the folks at the National Herbarium said, they've got a slingshot. We, we, <laughs> they're knocking down the parts from, from the tree to get the flowers and the fruits. So not available or necessarily easily. Uh, accessible. Let me review the bark types to, to summarize them. We've got our iron bark with the hard that leaky fish ships form, stringy barks, long soft fibers. There's also box bark, which is rather flat but is finely textured, and tessellated, which is polygons, often flaky. So I'll show quickly one of each of those. And the alternative is to not be rough at all, but to be smooth and you can be wholly smooth and the whole tree is really smooth or just partly smooth when usually the upper part is smooth and rough uh, below so you can see here the uh, apple box the eucalyptus bridges the anna which is box bark so that's fairly smooth with this textured look and then we have here tessellated bark divided up into these polygons and some of them flaking off so that's corandia uh, eximia the yellow uh, bloodwood there and then the smooth bark. So uh, this is uh, Eucalyptus saligna, Sydney blue gum, where the bark is uh, wholly smooth and um, very common in some parts there in, in Victoria, especially Eucalyptus feminalis, so-called manna gum, where the bark is smooth above, but the, the rough 
uh, part is retained below. They actually call it, they call it the sock on the, on the tree, the, the, the rough part below, they call it the sock, like a sock on, on a foot. So let me summarize the whole story for eucalyptus then. So we've got eucalypts uh, comprise 934 taxa, mostly endemic to Australia. A few of them actually extend up into islands to the north, but not many. This diversity arose over 25 million years of species radiation throughout Australia, following isolation and subsequent migration of the continent, combined with the transition from a seasonal wet forest to a variety of mostly sclerophyll biomes, as per the work of CRISP and others. Identification tools to navigate this diversity include an online and interactive multi-access key. Um, information on region and bark generate manageable shortlists, but species identification typically requires flowers and uh, fruits. Well, I got back from Australia and off I went to British Columbia. I'm used to in, used to in Manitoba looking at mosses. Um, we might go to a stand of black spruce there and, and we look down and we'll see some mosses there. We might find uh, feather moss like fluorosium here forming these carpets and mounds there below the black spruce. Or you might find some sphagnum, here's sphagnum capillifolium. And uh, very common in our part of the world. And underneath the the, um, the the black spruce, it'll be green. But then if you find it in the open, it'll be red, instantly red bulb moss. But under the microscope, the structure is identical. It's the same species. Phenotypic expression is an uh, expression of pigment differences here for the same moss. So off I go out to British Columbia in March, and uh, it's um, it's glorious out there. And by the roadside, just looking out from a roadside pulling, we've got rocks everywhere. I was in West Vancouver, I looked down, and some of these mosses here are rather yellow in color. And are they are they just attractive here? Rockometrium, the hairy fringe, hairy that sort of hoary fringe moss there is really attractive and. And I can take a hike out to Vancouver Island, two and a half hours of strenuous hiking through the rainforest. Um, it's muddy, it's slippy. Um, you've got to negotiate fallen trees. I can go over them, go under them. Um, big challenge. You get to the, the, the beach there on Vancouver Island. And all along the way, there's wonderful bryophyte growth. And here I am looking at a fallen cedar. And this is actually a little word. What, it looks like a moss, Herbertus. It looks like a moss, but so why is it a liverwort then? Because the leaves in a liverwort are just a single cell thick, sheets of cells, one cell thick. In a moss, um, at least centrally on the leaf, uh, typically more than one cell thick for uh, moss leaf. So liverwort is just a plain old sheet of one cell thick. Or uh, you might find an epiphyte uh, there, like lanky moss, you know, growing on. Uh, or there's a competition at the end to see who can pronounce most diadelphus if you want to join the room. Okay, so what are the questions on bright bites? So you, you might think, well, we should have the answer to this already. What is the diversity of mosses and liverworts in Canada and Manitoba? And the answer is we're still working on it. It's it's uh, this is under construction. It's not that far advanced. It, we, we're still working on it. And how does this diversity of bryophytes relate to that for vascular plants? We know that as we come up through the gradient from the equator to the poles, we, we lose diversity. And so we come up through the states into Canada, into higher latitudes, into Manitoba, and so on. So we lose vascular plants. And we see a similar pattern to the same degree for mosses. So what's it like for mosses? Does it behave the same way? So earlier study, Bird 1966, a catalogue of bryophytes for the Prairie Provinces, expanded in 73 by Bird, and then the work of Birchill in, in Winnipeg, actually, he, he, working through the U of M homepage, produced a very industrious effort there, a, 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 expanding the, 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 the checklist using papers up to 2011. Um, so these are good checklists, but they include many varieties that are no longer recognized. There's been a bit of lumping, they call it lumping and splitting. There's been a bit of lumping going on. Uh, so, and then also uh, there was, in Bird's work uh, through virtual, they were listing species they expected to find. They said, well, it's in Ontario, so we think we're gonna find it in Manitoba as well, but as yet not confirmed for the province. And so, Maybe after all these years, you know, we're looking at the half a century there, maybe not, not actually here after all. 
Mark, there's a new kid on the block. We've got Flora of North America. Here we go. Flora of North America, uh, 2007, 2014, two volumes, each the size of a telephone book, three inches thick each. And here's Sphagnum Capillifolium. We have a distribution map, this man, Manitoba. And we actually even get a list of provinces, territories, and states for occurrence. And we've actually got this data now for Manitoba and for Canada for mosses. So let me set the scene here. We've got the world, 300,000 vascular plants, 12,000 mosses, 6,000 liverworts. North America, 20,000 vascular plants. So we go to Flora in North America and it lists a, a, a summary table saying there's 1,402 mosses in North America. There we go. Stotler and Crandall Stotler in their paper 2017 have a checklist for liverworts, 582, but they they were a bit more vague, sketchy, broad brush with the distributions. It, it'll not break it down state by state and province by province, unfortunately, but regionally they give information. So we can't yet eliminate those question marks for liverworts, but we should be able to put in the numbers for the mosses there. We know the vascular plant numbers for Canada because we've got C, that's Scoggin, Flora of Canada, 78, and Manitoba, 1,541 D, that's Scoggin, Flora of Manitoba, 1957. So we can just go through, all I have to do is go through all 1,402 species and count the dots. Well, let me say, I can, I can have a go at this, maybe. Here's sphagnum, here's sphagnum, and uh, 285 species for the world, 89 for North America. And so all I need to do is generate my Excel sheet here with all my provinces and territories. I've only listed 12 species here. That's the first subgenus. There are nine subgenera in Sphagnum. And so I would carry that on way off down here into the floor for 89. But to illustrate the point, just the 12 species, the first 12 species there. And for each one, it's presence or absence. There we go. And of my 89 species of North American sphagnum, 86 are in the USA, 74 in Canada, three only in Canada, not USA, and 23 in Manitoba. There we go, 23 species of sphagnum in Manitoba, 74 species of sphagnum in Canada out of 89 for North America. Well, I haven't finished yet. I've done eight genera. Okay. Well, what's the data for eight genera? I could use some help. Maybe I can think, I'm going to have to figure out a cute way to do it digitally. I'm working on that. So here we've got Brachythesium, Dipranum, Hypnum, Plagiomium, um, uh, Polytricum, Polytricastum, Atricum. And we see there's 89 species for sphagnum in North America. And if I total up for the other genera there, all eight, I've got 193. That's, that's, so I've done 14% of the floor at one fourth percent of the floor so I've got a bit of work to do unless I can speed it up digitally somehow and uh, so look for Canada then 164 of those 193 species occur in Canada that's quite a lot actually isn't it? that's 85 percent and then for Manitoba 69 out of 193 show up in Manitoba that's 36 percent I think these are pretty big numbers um, so I can use those numbers to go back to my table and use estimates. If I am to, if I put the numbers in here in red, I can apply those numbers as estimates and say, take that 85% and apply it to my 1402. I should have 1192 species of mosses in Canada, and my 36%, I should have 502 species of moss in Manitoba. And I get, I have to check it. This is just an estimate for now, for today, but. Somewhere down the road, I'll finish this work and we'll get a, a good count here and get those numbers firmed up. And of course, we don't know for the liverworts, we'll have to leave those as question marks for now. But you could say to me, well, these mosses, you know, Dr. Nagani, well, these mosses, they're all naturally occurring. And these vascular plants, there's a whole lot of introduced species here. But we know there's 4,500 introduced plants in North America. and Canada and Manitoba, Scoggins listings did break it out as to naturally occurring and, and introduced. So let's 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 flush that out. Let's break it out and come down. So I've got the extra column in here now. Natural vascular plants. There we go. 1550. 
3220, uh, 3269 for Canada, 1342 for natural vascular plants for Canada and Manitoba, respectively. And just produce my numbers again there. Let's calculate the percentages, take mosses pooled with the vascular plants, and then say, what percent of the mosses out of that pool? And we go to the globe, and it's 4%. We go to North America, and it's 8%. And we come into Canada or Manitoba, and it's a monstrous 27%. If we take the pool of mosses and vascular plants and say, how much of that pool in species count is attributable to the mosses? It's more than a quarter. That's a lot. That's a lot. Look at the fall off in look at the fall off in species as we come into Canada. That polar tropical diversity gradient really kicks in as we go on through there. Manitoba, then it's smaller, but still we get the reduction. But the, the fall off is much more modest for these mosses. So what does that tell us? tells us that if we're going to look at something we're going to call diversity in Canada and Manitoba, then we have to look, look at the bryophytes too. They are far too important in terms of species counts to be overlooked. We have to include them. They are a big part of our diversity, much more so proportionally than in more southern uh, balmy climes. And uh, why would that be? Perhaps it would be something to do with with a great abundance of moist environments across our vast wilderness areas of, of Canada. So let me summarize the whole thing on Brian Pines, my final slide on 38 minutes. As a fraction of those in North America, that's a, a, a typo of North America, we can estimate that 85% of species of mosses are in Canada and 36% are in Manitoba. These are big numbers. Data for liverworts not yet available. Relative to vascular plants, species of mosses in Canada and Manitoba are especially well represented, seemingly with less abrupt attenuation at higher latitudes, and thereby demanding that we take more of an interest in them than hitherto we have done. That is my final slide. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Dr. Magano, for that uh, great presentation. Um, so now I'll open it up to a question period if anyone has uh, any questions. Yep. I don't need to jump. Would you hear Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. What's up? What's can you comment on Tasmania? So does it have unique diversity of importance or other because it's its own little island and has its own there are endemic species of eucalyptus in Tasmania. Yes, there are endemic species. Uh, there are also species there which are more broadly represented on the mainland as well. That there's a mixture of both. It's a both. And of course, the um the the, the a seasonal wet forest, um, it, it, there's no eucalyptus in Utah. Very few, very few, almost none. It's a there's a lot of species that are particularly associated with that um rainforest environment. Is, is so the whole west of Tasmania, yes. it's not eucalyptus. It's Mostly, that's right. Okay. And, it's, it, and as you come out of that zone, it's almost like stepping over a rope. It changes on the time. Amazing. The, the rainfall cuts. It's an astonishing. The, the cruise is magnificent. It's, it's affordable. And, uh, and the, you, you can get off. There's a landing. You can take a stroll. There's a boardwalk stroll. You see the so-called uh, Huon Pine is the conifer that was really uh, sought after. It's not a pine really, but it's a conifer and really sought after for shipbuilding. And there's a whole history there of uh, very interesting history of uh, you can see that the penal economy phase and the stories of the shipbuilding there. But tons of history and the Aboriginal, the, 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 the indigenous people, when they when they landed there, 
first they found the, the indigenous folks who were burning. Why why the whole bunch of fires everywhere? It's like after we fought in four and the prairies in Canada the time we showed the contact fought fires from horizon to horizon. So it's it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting question. I would highly recommend that one. Thank you. Now, uh, there are people there. Okay. Um, quick question. So you mentioned that we don't really have a lot of data on liver warts in comparison to uh, mosses. Would you estimate that the proportion of liver warts in Canada would be higher relative to the rest of the world in a similar way that mosses are? That we might vary regionally. I think that the representation of the liver warts in British Columbia would be... Uh, the, the rainforest environment could be pronounced. But I'm not sure when we get up into um, the north part of that habitat availability for the mosses is going to be more wetland um, at the, the level of your feet. Uh, and, and, and mosses are doing well there, but the, the limbworks uh, on, on, the, on the trunks of trees. Um, it may not it may not work out the same way. So I wouldn't like to suppose it will be the same. We'll, we'll have to wait and see as the later emerge. It might be, but I wonder if it won't be quite the same. Okay, thank you. Um yeah. when you go on that uh Euclid database and click on and find uh species, does it tell you anything about its growth habits or its ecological niches and do you think that information like that could be very could be significant in identifying species i, I use it all the time oh so if i go to uh, pull up you know, i can answer that question visually with only a moment so if i just click on this little tab here there's an information sheet for you to to sign an oxymoron Photos, full description of habitat. And that's true for all 934. So it's a really good data thing. I, I think they've done an excellent job. And I, I wish we had one. I wish we had that for example for some of the difficult taxa in, in North America. I'd, I'd love to have this similar facility for, say, sedges, the genus Carex. For example, across Canada and Manitoba, it would be wonderful. Um, willows, you know what I mean? Some of those difficult tax services would be transparent. So it's a model to follow up. Is there something like that for like Spagnum or anything like that? Like a software on that? I'm not aware. If you all give me a book, so <laughs> Do you want to write one? <laughs> yeah, but, but, yeah. Yeah. but it would be great what, to get into the mosses. I, I, the, and the mosses, absolutely, they would be wonderful. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess you start off with your, in the case of eucalypt, the eucalypts, uh, Angrophora, Corandia, eucalyptus, you do 934 data sheets like this, and then you just have to generate this kind of, within this software template. They already have one for Caseans. In a 1200 acacia taxa in Australia, that they've already moved on. So the template, and I've looked at their the acacia page, and it's the format and, and the environment is, is the same. So uh, this template is obviously amenable to just work with a different database, and off you go. I don't know whether there'll be rights that you need to build and so on. But the potential is there. Yeah, we can go to Carex, we can go to Sangman. Count me in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's really, really helpful. Anybody else have any questions? All right, I'll ask one then, I guess. So uh, again, with this software, um, I guess the first um, type of way to get through all the species is by regional distinction. Um, has there been any uh, literature or anything like that on if these species are starting to spread into other areas? Um, than they're used to, I guess, due to reasons like climate change, different weather, weather patterns, anything like that. I think it's really only come to full documentation in, uh, in the last um, 
few decades, uh, and um, the, the, the in terms of books, there is a book on eucalyptus for South Australia, and there's a book on eucalyptus for Victoria plus uh, Tasmania. But that's it. It's a fellow called Dean Nicol in Adelaide who's known. It. But there aren't corresponding books for specialist flora for eucalyptus for, say, Western Australia or, or, or New South Wales, because it's not there. So this is, they've rushed ahead with these data sheets, they've rushed ahead to, to generate this. And you see that the release date online was 2015. So we've only been up a decade. Um, and, and so um, I think if there are going to be um, patterns of migration, disappearance and expansion, then this will be one way to monitor them. But it's, it's all too new. I don't know. Uh, any final questions? Yeah. I ask one more. So the, the fire scene moved to Australia in 2020. Um, was that lots of eucalyptus? So that's part of, as you said, they're very flammable, right? Or what is. Burn, and they come back. There are fires happening. There are a few species which don't fire that well, but the very tallest eucalyptus, eucalyptus regnans, mountain ash, the, that actually has to come back from seed, but most of them have the epicormic growth or the no tuba to come back. And so yeah, these they're, they're fire adapted and they will come back. I just on that point, I was in New Zealand yeah. that year. And uh, so you're looking up at the snow at elevation on the mountains in New Zealand. And because of the dust that has come across, as they call it there, the trench, not the pond, from a thousand miles or so from Australia to New Zealand, the dust had come over and it was so fine. But when you look at these snow banks on elevation on the mountains, it looks like the color of a band aid, not white, wow. from the dust. So those fires were just unique in the the volume, like the, those areas would normally be burned. It was just so much more. fires. What was unique about that fire? That was different? fires are um, natural part of the um, sclerophyll biome, and you can see the adaptations in in, in the eclipse for that. Um, we know well from North America that. If we have fire suppression without periodic control burns, we run the risk of catastrophic fire. I don't know what the Australian story is. Maybe that's the part of it. Makes sense. Yeah. If Tracy had a lot more. Yeah. Um, so, because they're so abundant in species, um, is there uh, is there a market for it? There are locals using it? Um, are they being exploited for their properties there? Do you know any the of The big that? one is, is uh, the eucalyptus oil. It is the eucalyptus oil. Um, there are plantations for lumber. Uh, eucalyptus globulus, the food gum, is, is widely planted as a plantation species. They do use eucalyptus uh, globulus for the oil as well, but the you get about 75% oil in the extract from that species. There are smaller eucalypts, they grow specially for the oil where you can get 90% concentration. And then um, it's, uh, of course, the horticulture industry is going to go to Florida. Good time is. Eucalyptus um, juvenile leaves um, and used it as a floral space. That's an enormous market now. Any, anyone else? All right, well, uh, please join me again and thank you, Dr. McGonagall, for today's presentation. Uh, as I said before, next week's presentation will be given by Dr. Colin McCarter of uh, Memphis State University. Um, we will be speaking on wetland wildfires releasing our uh, toxic industrial legacy. So this talk will be given via Zoom, so we hope to see you here, but uh, that's always an option as well.
Thank you.